This meeting is being recorded. Great. Thank you, Jessica. My name is Judith Burfoot. For those of you who I don't know, I am the founder of All Welcome Here Rural BIPOC Association here in Prince Edward County. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Natasha Henry Dixon this evening. Um, Natasha will be discussing early Black inhabitants of Prince Edward County who were enslaved by Loyalist settlers. She will contextualize their lives in her overview of her doctoral research project, One Too Many, The Enslavement of African Peoples in Early Ontario, 1760 to 1834. Natasha Henry Dixon is an assistant professor of African Canadian history at York University, my alma mater also. The 2018 Vanier Scholar is re researching the enslavement of African people in early Ontario. Natasha is the president of the Ontario Black History Society. Her publications include Emancipation Day, Celebrating Freedom in Canada, June 2010, Talking About Freedom, Celebrating Freedom in Canada, 2012. A number of youth-focused titles and several, several pardon me, entries for the Canadian Encyclopedia on African Canadian history. Through her various professional, academic, and community roles, Natasha's work is grounded in her commitment to research, collect, preserve, and disseminate the histories of Black Canadians. So welcome, Natasha, and thank you so much for this evening. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Judith, and thank you both uh, Jessica and Judith for inviting me to uh, speak this evening and glad we were able to coordinate um, this talk. Uh, my talk today is entitled, Enslaved in Prince Edward County, the Early Black Inhabitants of Three Royal Townships. And um, it's fitting that I was invited to speak uh, in August uh, as we continue for many of us um, who engage with Black history, uh, are continuing to examine emancipation, um, some call August Emancipation Month, uh, after marking Emancipation Day on August 1st. And so happy to be here with you again to share a little bit of uh, a, one particular aspect of Black history in Prince Edward County. I first wanted to um, recognize August 23rd, this two days ago, which is the International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its Abolition. It's observed annually, it's a United uh, Nations Day. And the purpose of the day is to raise awareness about the horrifying nature of the transatlantic slave trade and to remind people about the slave trade and its contemporary implications. Over the course of over 400 years, um, the transatlantic slave trade affected over 15 million African men, women, and children. And so this day is an important day to observe in memory the victims of the slave trade and also to recognize the very real ways that the legacies of this history continue to impact people of African descent and to promote as well a critical examination of the conditions and the behaviors and the perspectives and the ideologies that led to the instituting of this system of oppression. And these kinds of occasions in remembering those who were enslaved, it is common customer ritual to engage in various um, ceremonial practices to recognize ancestors who were enslaved. And one of those is the pouring of libations, the image that you see here, where there are different um, drinks that are poured, water or alcohol, depending on the occasion to offer. And these are an offering to honor um, ancestors and to recognize again uh, and their presence uh, with us. And so wanted to again set the tone for this conversation in recognizing um, again these individuals as people, which I will talk further about in my talk. 
my talk today stems from my current research looking at the history of the enslavement of Black people in Upper Canada, which is the name of what on, uh, Ontario, present-day Ontario um, is. And uh, my research project is titled One Too Many, the Enslavement of Africans in Early Ontario between 1760 and 1834. And so to begin a little bit about, um, you know, setting the context for uh, how slavery came to be instituted in Upper Canada. Uh, enslavement was uh, an institution, it was practice and it was custom for 206 years in the French and then subsequently British colony that came to be Canada. And over the course of this time, at least 4,500 Black people were enslaved in these colonies. And the result of um, the enslavement of African people, Indigenous people initially, and then African people, um, is very much connected to the wider project of imperialism and colonization. Uh, and so uh, enslavement was one of those mechanisms through which those projects were achieved. And so the colonies of um, what we now call Canada are very much connected and implicated in the wider global phenomenon of the transatlantic slave trade in many ways in the trade and the um, the sale and of, of people of African descent as chattel, as property, in the building of slave ships, ships that would transport uh, African captives from uh, the west coast of Africa to different parts in the Americas. There were at least 19 um, ships that were commissioned by um, merchants uh, in, the, um, in the UK, in Britain, to um, build these ships in order to uh, engage in that trade. Along with those, um, along with the people who were taken, uh, there were also slave produced goods that were exchanged. And these slave produced goods were part of what were consumed and sold and bought here in Upper Canada as well. Um, and so just as an example, here is uh, an excerpt from a ship manifest of one of the many ships that arrived in the port of Quebec in 1818. And we see here coming in from, um, from Jamaica, from Bermuda, we see rum, we see sugar, coffee, molasses. Um, so these were goods that were coming in and being bought and sold by merchants here and being consumed by settlers. Um, and so there, this demand as well also drove, um, right, this, the production of these products in the places like the Caribbean. And then it may be a bit more known now that the codfish that was caught, that was fished here in, um, in the, uh, the East Coast, those um, goods were shipped and some timber were shipped to um, the Caribbean. And these were part of the exchanges as well in the commerce. And so these are just a few ways that um, Canada, what we now call Canada, is very much tied to, um, to slavery in very complicated ways. And unfortunately, this history is not always taken up in all of its complexities. Um, and, and we, I'll talk about that further. Here is just an, uh, an advertisement that a merchant in, in, sorry, in Kingston um, published in the Kingston Gazette in 1812. And again, among the list, the, the list of goods that um, they listed as being available included sugar and tobacco. We have cotton products. Again, all things that um, used uh, slave labor. And so this is one of the, these are some of the ways that Prince Edward County is connected to the transatlantic slave trade. Also very much um, in a more concrete way with the importation of uh, African people who were um, brought in as enslaved people into the county. 
the three royal townships that were established upon loyalist relocation after the American Revolution were Sophiasburg, Emiliasburg, and uh, Marysburg, the numbered townships five, six, and seven, and Hollowell and Bloomfield were also included. In my study um, thus far, I've been able to identify that at least uh, 20 Black people were enslaved in uh, Prince Edward uh, County. These individuals include uh, several enslaved people um, who were held uh, by Nicholas Lazier in Sophiasburg. Uh, and one of the people that he enslaved was a woman noted in some loyalist uh, documentation who was known as well, supposedly well known as a Methodist. There was uh, the son of a woman, an enslaved woman by the name of Sarah, who was purchased by Abraham Barker from fellow loyalist Silas Hill. And the result of this sale separated the mother from her son and son from his mother. Ebenezer Washburn enslaved at least one person, um, a, a young woman, and uh, Joseph Allen brought with him three people that he enslaved, Tom, Sam, and Sal or Sally, and then purchased a young woman by the name of Mary from Henry Finkel. And as I mentioned earlier, Silas Hill, he had purchased um, Sarah from and her son from uh, Joseph Allen before they were, subs they were subsequently separated. And then well-known Major Peter Van Alstein brought with him three people that he enslaved. Here is uh, one of the Ontario heritage plaques, one of several that mark and honor and recognize um, loyalist settlement in the province, the province and their, um, their contribution to its uh, colonial foundings. Uh, this plaque notes that on June 16, 1784, that a party of about 250 loyalists landed by boat near this site and this um, in uh, Adolphus town and that they had sailed from New York in the fall of 1783 under the leadership of Major Peter Van Alstein, who I mentioned, uh, who was a loyalist of Dutch ancestry. They had wintered in Sorrel in Quebec. Van Alstein was later appointed a justice of the peace, represented this area in the first legislative assembly of Upper Canada and built at Glenora the earliest grist mill in Prince Edward County. This plaque is one of many um, heritage plaques and a lot of the early uh, uses and installations of um, heritage plaques recognize loyalist history. And, um, you know, and looking at some of these early plaques, none of them or very few of them recognize um, the presence of the, pe the Black people that were enslaved by uh, the loyalists. Uh, and so when we look at how we come to know or continue to not know about the presence of, um, of, of enslaved people and the common practice of enslavement, that um, the process of creating these stories, the process of recognizing the heritage um, plays a role in what it is that we know and do not know and how much we know of this history. And so, you know, I point that out, you know, for many reasons, obviously, in, in the conversation, but also to think about the relevance and the importance of the work that I am doing in really um, ensuring that this, this experiences and the contributions of those who were enslaved were, are, are documented and recognized. In this one of many instances of loyalists coming to settle in the royal townships, um, there were enslaved people who were brought in with them. Um, in all of the movement and all of the sometimes melee of having to evacuate uh, the 13 colonies, 
come up to uh, different temporary encampments in, uh, in Upper Canada and in Quebec, that loyalists, those who held property in slaves, ensured to bring as, they, as many as they could the, the in people that they enslaved in those 13 colonies with them. As a result, the number of Black people who were enslaved in Upper Canada increased uh, dramatically. And uh, under British, the British uh, regime, the demographics of those who were enslaved shifted from um, largely or majority Indigenous people that was done uh, under the French to almost exclusively uh, Black people who were held by property by the British. And so then this number then increased with the influx of uh, loyalist refugees and subsequent settlements in Upper Canada, including uh, Prince Edward County. And so when a lot of these loyalists um, were coming either temporarily, they were using um, uh, the, here the province a, as defense uh, for the military during the course of the American Revolution, the people that they enslaved, some of them were with them and working alongside with them in many different capacities during the course, course of the war. And then post-war and permanent settlement, um, enslaved people were again there and played an instrumental role in the settlement, um, the colonial settlement of the province. When I talked about looking at the movement of those who were uh, of um, enslaved people come being brought into Upper Canada, they were coming from many uh, directions. They were coming uh, from the very far west end at the, the Windsor Detroit corridor. They were coming in um, through the Niagara uh, entry points and then also coming in as well in the more Eastern end and coming through um, along the St. Lawrence River and across. Uh, and so there are many entry points of enslaved people um, coming in. And just to show you the ways that, um, you know, the different ways that they were coming in and also some of the challenges then in identifying all of the people who would have been brought in enslaved um, because not all were documented. And so you know, we can only go by, right, what record keeping was done. Um, this is one example. So in the uh, famed Book of Negroes, I think we um, or would know the book, I think more, um, more now because of the work of Lawrence Hill, his book and then the, the mini series. Uh, and, and his, so his was a piece of his, book was a piece of historical fiction rooted in the actual historical document, the ledger, the military ledger, um, the Book of Negroes. And in this, there were quite a number of enslaved people who were brought in with loyalists. And so the Book of Negroes is known because it records those who, um, Black people who received their freedom um, because they served in some capacity uh, in the British military during the uh, American Revolution. And in order to be able to gain their freedom, they had to be relocated to places such as New Nova Scotia, which then became Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And then there was movement of people to settlement in different co colonies here, um, you know, near and far. Uh, and so what some of the uh, enslaved people who were brought in by the loyalists, so there were those who were free and then in the same boats were those who continued to be held captive by loyalists. So those who obtained their freedom were the property of the patriots. And this was part of the military strategy to impact and to hurt their enemies. Um, but those who were held enslaved by loyalists remained that um, enslaved and the offer of freedom did not pertain to them. And so in the Book of Negroes, there are several instances of enslaved people being brought in by loyalists. And a lot of these loyalists then would come on to settle in different townships uh, in Upper Canada, including Prince Edward uh, County. Here we see an entrance uh, on the ship uh, and the ship is named uh, the Three Sisters and uh, it was bound for Quebec. And on the ship manifest, we see that there are three people enslaved by uh, Major Van Alstine. 
here, Kaf Ben Alstein, who's noted as a 16 year old stout lad and noted as being the major's own property. Pusi is a 30 year old woman. Um, and she again is identified as um, his property. And then a child, um, again, appearing to be Pusi's child and also um, major, the major's property. And that child would have been, um, you know, being born to a mother that was enslaved, then automatically inherited the status of being enslaved. So enslaved people, these again are just a, a few. And if you can um, look at uh, a couple of the names here underneath, we notice that um, John Johnson refers to Sir John Johnson um, and he himself in other documents have, he brought in to Upper Canada uh, 14 enslaved people. Um, and so these records, again, in tracing some of these individuals uh, through some of these many records, um, really uh, takes quite a bit of research and, and going back to refer to a lot of military records, uh, but these provide some very useful uh, information uh, and some identification of these individuals, because again, they only show up in these records as chattel, and so it's, it's limited in terms of uh, what we come to know about them without going and referencing other secondary materials and how we interpret these stories, as I will talk about a bit more. And so these people who were enslaved were brought, were bought and sold um, in Prince Edward County and were, were treated as and viewed as commodities. And uh, enslavement in Upper Canada carried on um, going into the 1820s and uh, and when I'll talk about the relevance of the Slavery Abolition Act or the uh, Emancipation on August 1st, 1834. In the vicinity of uh, Prince Edward County, in the nearby Kingston area, there were at least 35 Black people enslaved by 17 enslavers. The slave labor regime introduced in Upper Canada was specific and unique form of racial slavery. And this was instituted to establish a cheap controllable labor force. And it was shaped by the creation of social categories based on racial and physical dis difference. These differences were then systematized and legalized to solidify white dominance through the implementation and adaptivity of hereditary chattel servitude based on race. The instituting of a racial labor regime was bolstered by the creation and altering of racialized legal and social statuses of those held captive in order to support colonization and financial success of individuals and the colonies. As a central pillar of colonization, enslavement was fluid, it was flexible, and it was adaptive to particular environments, including Upper Canada. Wherever slavery was instituted, it took shape based on practice, environment, geography, and policy. It never looked the exact same way everywhere. But the idea that people wanted to impose it and that it existed for 206 years is important for us to understand. And this is important as well because oftentimes the conversations around um, slavery in, in, in Canada is often um, diminished by saying, well, you know, there wasn't a plantation system. Um, the numbers were less than, you know, in the United States or in the Caribbean. Um, and we really have to problematize that and disrupt that and instead look behind the, the, the fact that the institution itself was established. It was transplanted. It was established here and that it looked um, differently than were it, uh, in other places and in other um, jurisdictions. Enslaved Black people in Upper Canada labored in all kinds of occupations. 
They cleared the land, they chopped wood and built structures like homes and barns on the land grants that was allotted to their enslavers. And they built military fortifications as well during and post um, the, the war. Enslaved men worked in a range of um, occupations such as hunters, voyagers, sailors, miners, fishermen, bateau men, and dock workers. Enslaved men also commonly labored in the skilled trades as blacksmiths, carpenters, cobblers, wainwrights, and coopers. Many were manservants to their male enslavers, and others labored along their enslavers in trades and sales. Enslaved Black women were forced to labor primarily as domestic servants. In providing personal care, like bathing and dressing, enslaved women did so for both white males and females, while enslaved men did not serve white women, only white men. Newspaper advertisements in this study that I encountered in scholarly research showed the range of feminized duty that enslaved women performed. This included cooking, churning butter, washing laundry, hairdressing, making candles and soap, milking cows, making preserves, tending to chickens, fetching water, and gathering firewood. Other common tasks that they did include sewing, weaving, knitting, carding, serving families and guests, washing pots and pans and dishes, and completing, completing a litany of household chores. They were on call to meet the needs of their enslavers 24 hours a day. The extent and financial and social value of domestic work performed by enslaved women was significant. Many enslaved women and men labored alongside their enslavers in the businesses that the latter operated, included skilled trade shops, merchant stores, mills, inns and taverns, and even newspaper publishing. On small farmsteads, enslaved women were more likely to perform most of the same agricultural labor um, or country business as it was often called and alongside as the same kind of work as well that enslaved men would have done. And then when we get to enslaved women, their added contribution is that of their reproductive labor. And this is one of the ways that enslaved women further enriched their, the families, uh, the settler families that enslaved them. Um, as I mentioned earlier that uh, slavery was hereditary and, uh, and that's how the law came to be used in order to institute that. And so any children born to enslaved women were automatically, and they inherited their mother's status. And so they were, they automatically were born as um, with that slave status and were the property of um, the people who enslaved their mother. And so we see this in many cases that there are children who were born um, into slavery in, in Upper Canada. Their forced labor contributed to the immediate home economy and by extension stretched into the sustaining the local colonial economies. Slavery in whatever form it took was extractive. Enslaved black people reaped none of the economic benefits from their labor and did not inherit or benefit from any of the land grants or the land um, plots that um, their loyalist enslavers uh, benefited from. So at the end of the American Revolution and going into the next decade, um, slavery continued, as I said, and, and there is one pivotal moment as well that can added to the complexities of the circumstances of enslavement in Upper Canada. On March 14th, 1793, a woman, Chloe Cooley, enslaved by Adam Vrooman in Niagara, uh, on the Niagara area, Queenston, um, she was forcefully bound by her enslaver as well as three other men, tied and um, put into a boat because uh, Adam Vrooman wanted to sell her across into New York. Um, 
And the context of that is that there were whispers apparently among white settlers and the, as well as enslaved black people that the new Lieutenant uh, Governor Simcoe was going to abolish slavery. And so Vrooman and several other uh, loyalists who enslaved people were trying to minimize um, or mitigate their potential financial loss by selling uh, the people that they enslaved into the United States. And so what happened in this particular instant was that Chloe Cooley physically resisted and she screamed very loudly. And as a result, a uh, white man and laborer who worked for Vrooman by the name of William Grizzly and a black loyalist by the name of Peter Martin, who was also working with, well, for Vrooman in that vicinity, heard um, what was going on and observed this, um, this violent uh, interaction. And um, subsequently, uh, Peter Martin, the Black Loyalist, um, he was accompanied by William Grizzly, and they reported this incident to the Executive Council of the legislature, the provincial legislature. And so the Attorney General, John White, um, and Simcoe as well, used this instance to try to introduce legislation to abolish slavery. Adam Ruman was brought up on charges, but the only charges that were brought up against him was disturbing the peace. And the reason why was because slavery was accepted and it was common practice. And according to uh, that contractual law, property law, Ruman did not do anything wrong with his quote unquote property. In trying to um, put forth this bill, they received some resistance because almost half of the politicians of the first um, assembly themselves held property in slaves. And so over the course of some time, there was uh, a compromise, if you will, and the result was that the, pass the passage of the 1793 Act to Limit Slavery, which is the short form, and this legislation introduced gradual abolition to Upper Canada. And this legislation is noted as being um, one of the first anti-slavery uh, legislations in the British colony. What is important in, to take, in taking a critical look at this legislation is that first and foremost, it confirmed slavery as a practice and that it would continue. Um, and this reinforced the previous Imperial Act of 1790 that encouraged um, loyalists and other white settlers to import um, the people that they enslaved into the province to encourage a uh, wider settlement. Enslavement, as I mentioned, was upheld through contract law, property law, um, and, and, and through wills as well, which is another common document where we find people who were um, enslaved. And so first and foremost, that's what this legislation did. Those who were enslaved in 1793 would remain slaves for life unless they were manumitted by those that enslaved them. And then children born um, after Afterward, uh, would be, would be um, remain enslaved until the age of 25. And then when those children had children, they would be born free. So it was really over the course of um, almost you know, a couple of generations and going in well into um, the 1820s before, um, you know, there, this gradual abolition uh, would be felt. Uh, and so this is important to understand the legal mechanism of enslavement in Upper Canada. Uh, and, and it also then introduced uh, further complexities in regards to the social status of Black people in the province. And this act encapsulated these contradictions and complexities of both unfreedom, enslavement, and freedom. Because what it did say is that um, it maintained the slave status and in the province while simultaneously establishing Upper Canada as a place of freedom for Black people enslaved elsewhere. And so what this legislation also did was that it offered freedom 
to those who were enslaved in other places. And it said that if they were brought into the province, that they would automatically be freed. And so this again had some implications for the pursuit of freedom for black people during the early 19th century. Slavery um, has touched many aspects of the colonial settlement of Upper Canada. And it was custom from the West along the Detroit Windsor corridor to the East with the border of the province of Quebec. Um, in this study, you view uh, slavery as a key instrument of colonization in the particular manner that it manifested. Women, men, and children who were spouses, offspring, sisters, and brothers were held in perpetual bondage. And it's important to understand the institution and how it came to be uh, um, implemented here in Upper Canada. But of equal importance, it's to humanize the individuals subjected to these conditions, to recognize them as people worthy of historical study and worthy of being valued as contributors, being part of, um, being included as part of the public histories that are interpreted and that are shared and part of the common knowledge of local spaces in Ontario. The complexities of slavery and freedom in Upper Canada, um, you know, are, are many. And so they're really, you know, the work that I do and other scholars as well who attend to the history of the enslavement of Black people in Canada, um, continue to work to bring this through. And again, to, to trouble this idea uh, and the ways that slavery has been minimized, dismissed, marginalized, and even denied in some levels uh, as, it as part of our history. I have been able to trace a number of people who were enslaved in uh, Prince Edward County and in Upper Canada, and those, um, some of those in that number who actually transitioned to freedom, which is also quite interesting as well, and highlights the ways that we need to continue to center these stories as, as, as human stories of people who um, faced a, a condition that was imposed on them, an oppression that was imposed on them, but that they live their lives um, as people. And it, in sharing these stories, it better helps us to understand our colonial past that we continue to contend with today. And so my brief talk this evening, um, again, was intended just to briefly highlight the ways that um, uh, there has been a, a long Black presence uh, in Prince Edward County, and that this is just one aspect of that history, and there are many elements that I encourage people to continue to explore as it relates to, yes, the period of enslavement, but also post-emancipation um, and through contemporary times and to recognize um, Black history and Black presence as evolving, as complex, um, and, and, and to recognize, again, that there is a 400-year presence of Black people in Canada that can continues to need to be recognized as part of our national history and local stories. Uh, so thank you for listening to uh, my talk. I wanted to make sure that I left ample time for some of your, your questions. And so looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very You're much, welcome. Natasha. Um, I'm already excited to, to start uh, doing some more of my own research as well. Um, I see, oh, hi, Kat. Kat is lovely and she's one of our neighbors here at, uh, at the museum. So lots of like friendly faces and familiar, familiar names cropping up in the, uh, in the presentation this evening. And I see, I think Judith and I, if, if you're all able to uh, put your questions in the chat, if uh, depending on how many people have questions, but we will, uh, myself and Judith go back and forth and, and 
pose these questions to Natasha. So first up uh, from Melissa, and we know Melissa too, because she's also presented over Zoom uh, to our museum audience. Um, oh gosh, I need to make my chat bigger. This is just not, <laughs> they're coming in too fast and furious now. Um, okay, we're gonna minimize that and go into the chat. There we go. Okay, so Melissa, that was incredibly fascinating. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, this was, she sent it to me. Oh, thank you, but it's, it is a question for you. Um, when the slaves in Prince Edward County were eventually freed, do you know if they stayed in the area or if they moved? Well, we don't um, know that all were freed. Uh, again, because slavery um, remained a practice, as I said, and so those who were brought in um, could have been held as, as slaves for life, which many were. In my research, I have not encountered many manumissions. Um, uh, so that means that I did not encounter many instances where the people that enslaved them actually freed them. Um, there were, and, and so we can infer that many died in, um, in bondage and still uh, held as slaves. Um, there is, uh, in relation specifically to Prince Edward County, there's um, one individual that I continue to research, uh, a young woman who, um, who, who was free. So she would have been enslaved as a child. And during her early adulthood, um, it seems to have been freed. And so that is just one instance. And there are a couple of instances in other places as well um, in the province. In some cases, uh, there was a couple of wills that say, um, when I pass away, or uh, then the person, somebody would be freed. Uh, usually these were very old people, not the young people. Um, and then in the instances of young people who were identified in wills, um, that they were often passed to wives or children of the, in the family. And then they may have been offered their freedom after, for example, the wife passed away. So this was, you know, years ahead. And so we don't know um, how many people actually were, were freed uh, as a result, but the numbers seem to have been low given the patterns of those who continue to be held in slavery. I, I was just wondering as a, as a follow-up to that question, um, I'm curious if it would be easier to almost go backward and to start by looking at like census records um, and identifying people of color in census records later and then trying to work. I don't know. I don't know which direction is easier. <laughs> it's, it's They're both hard because, yeah. and I'll tell you another thing, yet another thing that adds to this the, 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 the difficulties in identifying those who were enslaved is that then over time you get interracial relationships and marriages. And so people of African ancestry or the, right, then their very visible blackness then dissipates. And then you have, you know, if you can have a few generations of um, into black white relationships and intermarriage, um, then that clear identification of those who descended from those who were enslaved is not very clear. It's not very obvious. So that that's something that that ends that that tends to be that. But if you're looking at not too far from the period of um, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, that that could be um, you could identify people. But then we know that we don't have our large census until 1851. So then you have to rely more on local. Uh, enumeration of um, local residents. And so those are some instances uh, as well. So it, it, there's another layer, there's, a, you know, another layer of, of uh, complexities there. Yeah, if I can ask a follow up question to that, just tweaked by what you were saying, do you know if there's much research done in Upper Canada, and thinking about census data, and I think you're talking about passing, as people in generations, their children become lighter and lighter and become white passing. Uh, and then they can kind of disappear in the census into like changing groups, right? And disappear as being recognized as black people. Mm -hmm. My question well, is, you know if anyone's doing that kind of research here 
in Canada because I did babble a little bit. Focus specifically on that. No, I've encountered a couple of families. Um, one of the, at least for me, a more known family is the family of John Baker in Cornwall, Ontario. He, his story is, is amazing, um, but he was born in, likely born in the temporary encampments in Quebec, enslaved by Major James Gray. And then when they permanently settled in Cornwall, he, his mother, his siblings were enslaved by the Gray family. Um, the son, Robert I.D. Gray, who was the first solicitor general for the province, inherited them. Um, but he noted in his will that he would he wanted them to be freed. Um, he passed away when a ship sank in Lake Ontario. And so John and his siblings became free. One of his siblings unfortunately passed away in that sinking. But then John went to serve in War of 1812 got married but over the course of time there's several descendants through his sisters um and there is actually um some people uh through to today who trace their lineage to that family but are i would say right who are visibly white because of generations of of interracial marriage so that's just one example but i don't know of anyone who is focusing specifically on that um on that Thank you. You're welcome. Should I find the next question, Jessica? Yes, I think Cody's is next if we're working our way down. <laughs> there, there are a lot that have come in. Oh, so. really? Okay. Excellent. So Cody asked a question. Um, she acknowledges this may be beyond your research or focus interest on Upper Canada, but can you speak a little about how or why or what circumstances led to some Black people arriving in Canada as loyalists loyalists, especially in the Maritimes, versus some arriving as enslaved people to loyalists. Right, yeah, so I touched on that a bit earlier, referring to the Book of Negroes, that the Book of Negroes documents upwards of uh, more than 3,500 Black people who um, are identified as Black loyalists, and so these were people who were enslaved in the States, and they were enslaved by patriots. And the offer through Lord Dunmore's proclamation was for those enslaved by patriots to come and serve in the British military and in exchange for their freedom. So those are the black loyalists. Um, that freedom was not offered to a loyalist, the black people enslaved by loyalists themselves. And so you had loyalists who obviously had to evacuate it due to the British loss, bringing with them the people that they enslaved and those people remain held enslaved, right? So that was just transferred, transplanted from the 13 colonies, wherever they may have come from to here, um, the called the British colonies here. Um, and so those are um, the two groups that you're referring to. Thank you. Um, and I would just, because Cody ended with that with, um, she was curious how the different groups uh, the two, you know, two distinct groups would have coexisted. So people that had, you know, been given their freedom versus not, um, especially, I presume that might have happened in the East Coast more here. so. Well, no, right here yeah. right, in, in families, right in the in families. And yeah. so one example is a family enslaved in downtown Toronto. The husband, Pompadour, obtained his freedom, but his wife, Peggy, and his three children remain enslaved by Peter Russell, the um, one of he was part of the executive council of the legislature. And so he worked for wages for Russell alongside his wife, his spouse, and his children who remain enslaved. And they remain enslaved for a long time. Um, so just so it shows you the right. So in one family situation, so think about the 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 tenuous situation that they they had. And then Russell wanted to sell Peggy and his son Jupiter several times. Um, so think about, right, the potential, that threat being hung over your head in, in the, as a family unit of being separated. And then it also shows that Russell, as a politician, as an individual, was okay with main, keeping a family, right? And, and the many loyalists chose not to, as I mentioned, not to free the people that they enslaved. So it, it, it's very, it actually is very common, and not only in um local communities where you have black people 
coexisting with these two, right? Con these two different statuses, but also in families as in black families as well. All right, would you like me to go next, Judith, or you? You can go next. And thanks for finishing up Cody's question. Yeah. Um, so Chris, there are lots of people thanking you for sharing your research, Natasha. I just want to make sure I give them a shout Thank out you. too. Um, but Chris asks, are there any ancestors of enslaved people in Prince Edward County now? Mm -hmm. And that's not, of course, your time period of research, mm -hmm. but it's... Uh, so that's not something I have um traced because we know research is ongoing and i do have to kind of stop at least at one juncture and put forth something and this is for my doctoral research but um i do um when i want when i return to the research i do want to try to trace some individuals what also adds to this as well is that a lot of enslaved people because they were property because they were not viewed as right as people quote unquote people or with personhood that they were not identified by name in some of the records and so you would note that i said well sarah um wasn't mentioned but the name of her son is not definitely known and so i you know to trace him for example would be a challenge um did their names remain the same right over the course of time so you know these are some things so to trace even one individual and those potential leads it take it's very um time consuming and so i i do want to return to 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 some that have more leads and then you know work my way through uh, but that also adds to that challenge as well yeah thank you so tom had a question he says, I'm doing some research here, so would appreciate any comment as to your sources or good sources to follow up. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have, I maybe Jessica can share my project website, Enslaved mm -hmm. Africans in um, Early Ontario. Um, I do have some information there. Um, there, you know, loyalist records, the same loyal, the records of related to loyalist history that people refer to are the same records that I'm drawing on in my research. So the military returns, some of the early town censuses, um, the, the, those are some of the records are drawing on church records. Um, so, you know, it, those are some of the records again, that you could go back to, to, to check, to take a look at. I will definitely share that. <laughs> I will share it. Uh, I do not have my link handy. Okay. Oh, let me see. I can, I can grab it while you read the next question. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, we'll it'll give you some time to think about. And actually, uh, Tom, I had read the first part of Tom's comment and missed the, the question, but that was one of my questions as well was about, um, was about sources, but also, um, I suppose I can pose mine now while I look, but I was curious what you might recommend regarding sources for just, you know, people out in the world, like more popularly available things for people to pursue that aren't necessarily primary sources, but if they want to pursue this, this topic further, um, is there anything available at the local library or, you know, mm -hmm. something that you might, might suggest? Well, again, it depends on if you're looking at, you know, Upper Canada, Canada more broadly, it's particularly right, Eastern Canada, or your county specifically. But again, um, one of the things that again, that I stress in my study is that, uh, as I just mentioned, the very same records that used to tell these fulsome um, stories of loyalist settlements are the very same records that um, enslaved people are documented in. So they have the primary sources, and then you have some of the other sources such as William Caniff's book, um, J.F. Pringle's books, a lot of the, the books of descendants of loyalists who put those those stories together. Um, are Those are, are, are some of the, the rich resources that provide leads into some of the these stories. Um, when you're looking at um, more contemporary work around uh, the history of enslavement. Um, 
you know, Dr. Afu Cooper's book, The Hanging of Angelique, looking at Mar Marie Joseph Angelique in Montreal, um, the work of Harvey Amani Whitfield, looking at um, Black enslavement in the Maritimes is, is you know, great current research. Um, so there's that. Uh, I had there's work uh, Charmaine Nelson, Dr. Charmaine Nelson, art historian, also is doing um, some great work as well uh, in regards to to that. Uh, I have a recent chapter that looks at the story of Beth, a black woman who was enslaved in Belleville, and that's a chapter in a new book called Unsettling the Great White North. Um, so there are people uh, who are interested in applying a different lens to the history of enslavement and really centering again um, these men, women, and children as historical actors, as a focus of a study. Um, and so, you know, there will be future work coming out as well that you can continue to look out for. Wonderful. I know, well, I'm, I'm just excited for, um, because when I, I shouldn't, I know no one should ask this of anyone who's completing their PhD. <laughs> <laughs> when are you when are you hoping to <laughs> publish this <laughs> well it, it needs to be finished first <laughs> that's you know so I'm almost there and then yes I do want to share it um in a publication as well and I should have mentioned that as well one of the things that um one of my approaches to my dissertation is is um telling these stories right center these as bio biograph these experiences as biographical narratives and so one of the things that I'm doing is a supplementary piece is a database and so when you go to my website you will see that the database is not available yet it's it's still under construction but I'm pulling together all of my research in this repository that serves as an archive of slavery because there's you know for years there's you know these things are just kind of scattered and disparate and pulling them in one place but also interpreting these um these documents in a way that centers the the stories and the experiences and the lives of those who were enslaved <laughs> cody's crying <Yeah>. to grad students <laughs> yes yes uh, um solidarity there i think <laughs> yes um all right let's see Judith, I'm not sure who we're down to now. I think we've covered the other Judith's question. Um, How about Jill? Question. Yeah, I think Jill's next. Um, I'll read it. Okay. <laughs> Jill says, my question is, is there any way to track the movement of enslaved people from Ontario to the East Coast? It's a, it's a challenge for some of the things, the reasons that I identified. It depends on how much documentation there is of this individual. Um, if you're talking about whether they um, stole themselves, if they fled, right? If they ran away, um, maybe there may be newspaper um, advertisements. Um, were they sold by the person that enslaved them to another colony? Um, that, that may provide other leads as well. Um, and so it's it's hard to say. It really these are right case by case basis in terms of the amount of documentation that there that there may be. And I do want to. Um, I just recall now. I wanted to. I meant to point something out in regards to um, Major Van Alstine that the mill that he one of the first mills that he operated is in that vicinity of, um, I guess, is it the basin of the Bay of Quint and the, is it Lake of the Mountain? Lake on the Mountain. Right? Lake, mm -hmm. Lake on the Mountain um, is in, was in that, uh, in Glenora, yes, thank you, um, in that, in that vicinity. And so um, I know someone had um, posed a question to me when I shared uh, this event ar around any connection in that vicinity. And so, as I mentioned, that the, the men, um, that he enslaved would have li likely would have been working alongside him in the mills that they um, that they established. And I wrote down the names of some of the slaveholders that you mentioned mm -hmm. because I am not a hundred percent sure um, because I believe Ebenezer Washburn died in around 1826 but this church that i'm currently sitting in was completed in 1825 and i have heard 
it's not in our burial records because the records don't really start until the physical uh, memorials that still survive out here. Um, mm -hmm. It's like 1828, but I know there were burials before and I've heard of Ebenezer Washburn. There's a possibility he might be buried in the cemetery right where I am. So it was interesting hearing that name that I've, you know, I've it jogged my memory in some way. And, um, you know, just to think that these individuals that we have spoken of for a long time in this area uh, without mentioning any any notion of that that yeah. part of their their story yeah. um, and the story of the people that they that they associated with and the people they enslaved. So um, I believe Lindsay's question is next. Thank you, Natasha. Great talk. Uh, I like a couple of other questions. Yes, curious about how you go about doing your research, especially how you found the names of the enslaved people in Prince Edward County specifically. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of outlined it, but um, uh, it, it's a lot of work and uh, in archival research. Um, as again, some of the information coming out of some of the secondary sources, these loyalist um, uh, histories, right? That have that have mentioned. Um, and then, you know, just researching in, in, in a range of, uh, of archives, whether it's um, church records, uh, local records, town records, any possible enumerations. Again, um, the military records are vast. I, I mean, I don't know who could ever go through all of those records in the Haldeman papers. Um, those records are so right, voluminous. <laughs> there, there's just so many, but those are the kinds of things that I then kind of trace back to. Sometimes it's just, you know, I happen to find, encounter something, not even looking for it, and then get another lead and then try to pursue that. So, um, so it's looking at the secondary sources and uh, primary sources as well. And then when you come, become better versed in, um, in order to do this, I have to become more versed in, in loyalist history and early loyalist history in order to uh, again identify these records. And that also includes research stateside as well, because this is where um, uh, these people who were enslaved were brought from. You had a couple of final questions there? Oh yeah, oh, we've got a lot. We've got, there's a lot more. I'm just waiting on Judith. <laughs> Judith oh, is next. It's, it's, Penny's, it's Penny's question next, Judith. All right, Penny has a question. She would like to know, uh, has there been any initiative to recognize some of this information in provincial plaques? Mm -hmm. She has a secondary question about hearing nothing um, to acknowledge August 23rd, even on the CBC, and wondering why not. Well, I, I, I can't speak for CBC. Um, it's something, again, it depends on the knowledge of people. Uh, and, I, and I guess, you know, your circle, the circle of interest as well, right? So you, it's, it's hard to say, um, but, you know, these are things that um, people who engage with this kind of history Black history, slavery, history related to slavery specifically in this instance, um, try to bring awareness to. And so that's, I'm glad that, you know, that's why I felt it was important to open up with that. There has been some recognition of enslaved people through a heritage plaque. So I just go back to um, this Chloe Cooley plaque that was uh, installed in uh, 2008, I think, but as a result of the 200th, um, commemoration of the abolition of the slave trade, not slavery, of the slave trade. And this was through some of the work led by Dr. Afura Cooper to mark that occasion. Niagara on the Lake continues to do more work here. You see me sitting um, in the one of the, the gardens. They marked the 225th, I believe it was, um, anniversary of the Chloe Cooley incident. So that was a few years ago. Um, I mentioned John Baker just uh, last May, I believe it was, the annex branch of the United Empire Loyalists. Um, they worked with uh, the Cornwall Museum to put together a, a, a plaque or memorial marker for John Baker. And I was you know, so honored to be able to work on that and that text. Um, and so there's some work and increasing work being done. 
Um, but of course, there is a lot more because again, um, it, it's not an integral part of our early history and that's what we continue to strive for. All right, next we are, we're, we're getting there, Natasha. We've got a few more. <laughs> um, they came in, yes, they came in so many at the end there. Okay, um, Ellis, Ellis has a question. Thanks so much, Natasha. Why did loyalists transition from enslaving indigenous people to black people? So it was the French who, when they instituted slavery, in New France, um, they drew largely from the indigenous population. So based on the research of Marcel Trudel, um, about two thirds of those who were enslaved in New France were indigenous people and one third were uh, African people. The first introduced African person on, on record was a little boy by the name who was given the name Olivier Lejeune and he was brought in by merchant um, John de Kirk uh, in 1628. So uh, black people were about one third of those who were enslaved. But then when you, um, the, the, the transition under British regime right after 1760, 1763 um, was almost exclusively uh, black people because of that's how it was in other British colonies. And so you have these, right, these British um, uh, colonists coming from other spaces that was the, the 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 common practice and then by that time we also had as well that there was just this this move towards using um african people as enslaved laborers now judith i think you and i might have to we could take the next question perhaps um in addition because it, it does relate to um plaques in the county. So it says, yeah. is there any initiative by the county to erect additional plaques in PEC that acknowledge those who were enslaved here and educate people on slavery in the area? Um, and I mean, I can say from my perspective on the subject, I do not know if the municipality at a higher level is um, has this on their radar per se uh, to add additional interpretive plaques, but it's something that we will be pushing for. Should they be, um, there are a couple of interpretive trails, I think that the county is working on. So that are more all encompassing about particular areas in the county. And so I think pushing for more inclusion of this history in those trails that are already being worked on in addition to any new things they bring forward is pretty important. Um, from the museum's perspective, we don't, I don't, we don't have any plans to erect any plaques on our property uh, currently. But at the same time, we'll be doing more and more programming and events that are related to sharing this history whenever possible, and ensuring that any of the interpretation that we do on site and any materials that you know do manifest on our sites, permanent or otherwise, are inclusive of that of that history. Uh, Judith, do you know anything? anything no, else on I, your I can't say that I know of anything the municipality is is consciously doing at the moment. However, I will say, um, you know, if it's something that you believe in, I mean, so, so first of all, supporting something like this is is a really great way to send a message to the municipality that we are all interested in hearing all of our stories, right? All of our history. And if it's something that you're interested in doing a municipal uh, plaque at that level, it is something that you can very easily get engaged in doing, right? Those are achievable, right? We, we can do research. We've had some really great guidance about where to look and things we can move forward on. So I would encourage you to you know, get in touch with Jess, get in touch with me. I'm info at allwelcomehere.ca. And it's something that we can do. And I would just add Not that to. these, these um, heritage plaques, uh, especially those that um, want to be more inclusive and representative of, um, of other groups, 
um, because we know historically, and right, a lot of the heritage plaques focus on white settlement and, and, and contribution, that these um, come from individuals, organizations, more at the grassroots level um, that bring it to the decision makers, to the cities, municipality, the township or whatever, um, and, and through those submission processes. And so I think we have to look at it in that way and not what the what will be done from the top down, um, but they will be more responsive to, as you said, the interest and the push um, from, from different, uh, from the, the ground level. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh oh, it's my turn um, for It is, I think we're down to Lynn's question now. Um, Uh, Lynn asks, I've heard that there were also black people brought as indentured servants for nine years, bracket. Do you know anything about them? No, I haven't encountered um, any uh, information in regards to black people being indentured servants in Prince Edward County. Um, what I will say about indentured servitude is that um, going back to the 1793 Act to Limit Slavery, um, one of the aims to, I think, to continue to benefit those who enslaved um, was to transition uh, those who were enslaved to uh, more contractual indentured servitude for a particular period of time. And so they did that as a way to continue to have sources of labor. Um, and there was also a concern expressed in the legislation that they did not want those who were um, once enslaved to become the responsibility of the town or whatever. Uh, and so trying to ensure again that they would have some kind of upkeep from those who had enslaved them. That also ties into this notion that enslaved Black people needed to be in, you know, they needed guidance in some way to for employment um, or to, to, to support themselves. So there's also a very paternalistic um, nature of that, um, of that clause. So if that's what you're referring to, there may have been, there may have been some who transitioned from being held as chattel property to now um, indentured uh, servants through, right, through these particular terms, contracts. Okay, I think we're on to Renee's question here, uh, who is interested to know if there are any connections. I'm not sure, Renee, if you mean between Prince Ed, those enslaved perhaps in Prince Edward County specifically or not, but any connections to John Myers and the transatlantic slave trade? So John Myers, uh, loyalist John Myers did have, did enslave uh, a few people. And um, and so I guess if you're looking more locally as a poet, right? Yes, he, he would have, he held property in, 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 in black people. Um, and that automatically connects him to the wider, right, global practice of uh, the transatlantic slave trade. And I was just going to mention, Judith, before the next question, um, T. Riddles, who says, we have done this research for Kingston. I believe that cropped up when we were discussing, like, looking at census records and, um, looking at how people had sort of identified over generations and if that type of research could be done in specific areas, like having to look at different places. Um, perhaps that person could elaborate though in the, in the comments and because I saw it crop up and now I'm like, oh, can you link to your research in some way? I can't remember what that was related to. Um, but then I think we're down to um, Michael's question. Um. Michael asks, um, this is the edited version. So okay. did you mention earlier enslaved people working in printing shops? I wonder what the literacy, I wonder the literacy rate was like among the enslaved at that time and among the free people at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so that, and you can look to some of the research in Quebec, which is really quite interesting. The his name is Mr. Brown, I forget his first name now, but printer of the 
um, Montreal Gazette, Quebec Gazette, um, the people, there's a, a, a gentleman that he enslaved um, that worked uh, in the printing shop. Um, again, when we look at the way that slavery unfolded, um, that one of, you know, one of the common features of enslavement was that it was often um, illegal or wasn't custom to teach enslaved people um, to read and to write. Um, uh, but then there would obviously we know that there were instances where people would have done that subversively. But then you also had in some cases where, you know, individual enslaved people received instruction. So the, for example, the little boy that I mentioned who was given the name Olivier Lejeune, the first documented enslaved person brought in in 1628. Um, he was given his name by Father Lejeune, a Catholic priest. And he actually instructed him and taught him to read and write. So you have these individual instances as opposed to right the, the systemic practice. But generally speaking, uh, enslaved people were viewed as laborers, right? As, as forced laborers. And so teaching them to read and write wasn't something that was um, that was a, a, a priority. Jill asked, where can we access this recording after the presentation? So I have put a link to the PEC Museum's uh, YouTube channel. So once Zoom sends me notification that they've, uh, that the recordings are finished, I'll be uploading it hopefully tomorrow, uh, but it might take a little while. So I would check the channel sort of over the course of the weekend or early next week. Um, and just to hold me accountable, if you don't see it there by Monday or Tuesday next week, please do shoot me an email. Um, but that is where I'm hoping to host it. But I can also send you uh, a link over email too, if you would like an easy way to share it. Um, and I see down here, Ellis and Jess have shared a link to um, abolitionist newspapers through our Ontario.ca. Thank you, Ellis and Jess. Um, also, Mich Michelle, I'm just going through, because <laughs> this isn't a question yet necessarily, Judith. I guess it was, but here I am just taking over. Um, Michelle, thank you for sharing these uh, critical details about the role of enslavement and stolen labor in the development of Ontario communities. What steps might we, the attendees tonight, take to uh, help with the project of ensuring this history is publicly displayed at key sites in PEC? To clarify, my question is about next steps for advocacy. Mm -hmm. Well, the next step is being vocal, right, about your interests. And that means reaching out to Jessica and her colleagues that you're interested in, you know, the way that sites are interpreted and that they are inclusive of some of these stories that we want to see uh, permanent information as well as revolving uh, temporary um, uh, exhibits. Um, and programming such as this. Um, and so uh, I think that that, is, that would be great to, to push for that. Um, the, the attendance tonight, again, was, was really great. So that, again, shows that there was interest um, there. And, and so I think that should be happening on an, on an ongoing basis. So to express these interests and these concerns, encourage um, you know local school groups to um, highlight Black history where they can. Um, you know, are there as part of the work that Judith is doing in helping to share and raise awareness of some of this history? To that you're drawing on these resources and that you also can create resources um, collectively as well. So I really think that that those are some of the things. Um, that, that, that can be done. Um, and, you know, as information circulates as well, um, social media, websites, there were other, for example, Archives of Ontario, um, larger um, art uh, repositories as well, who are continuing to do more work. And some are emerging and some are just starting. People are at different stages. But to support that kind of work and to let them know that you want to see it. And then when it's done, that you are interested in, that you appreciate that that being done and that the history is really being more inclusive and representative of all of the, I, I, my word of the evening is complexities and of our history, right? And, and so I think that that's some of the things that can be done. Absolutely, and I would add, um, I think we've talked a little bit about advocating in our community for what you'd like to see. Um, 
And that means talking to not just myself and Jess, but talking to your counselor, which brings me, of course, to the fact that you have, we all have a municipal election coming. And I would encourage you all to vote and think about, you know, the kind of counselors you want to see and who represents those kinds of more holistic, complex, um, nuanced views. Mm -hmm. And I see Michelle is raising their hand. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to everyone specifically um, for the work that's being done, Natasha. I can't say enough how um, both personally and professionally, um, as my background as an educator um, here in the city of Toronto, I uh, was the one who brought up the, the comments um, yes, yes. previously about the history of Lake on the Mountain. Um, and I have been in the area uh, recently with a group of female friends who are here on the call as well. Um, and we felt a rootedness in the history of that land in that space. And we knew with the agrarian type of setting that we were in and the plaques indicating the um, age of the vicinity, we were already able to piece together what would have been happening there, but we spent some time at Lake on the Mountain and we were actively searching. We took pictures of the signage that was there and we um, looked to see what, what more um, should, be, should be included and it wasn't there. So I did um, include that comment um, asking what more we could do for next steps for advocacy because I think that as someone who is not um, immediately in Prince Edward County, but it's our history collectively um, in Ontario mm -hmm. communities, I really do want to impress upon everyone here who is immediately in PEC to actively um, take those next steps, something concrete to make that request to the councillor, to um, put that letter forward to the local newspaper, whatever actions specifically you can take within um, Prince Edward County, because it is really incumbent upon us to make sure that this history um, is beyond the selective audience today. And it's wonderful that there will be um, information included in people who go to museums or who at, sp at specific sites. But for those of us who want to ensure that the average person who's walking through any cityscape any location and can access in a way that is accessible um, information for everyone. So I just really wanted to impress that upon everyone today. Yeah, thank you so much, Michelle. That is a really great note to to end on. And thank you for um, you know for sharing your experience. I think um, for many of us who walk in this space as as, as Black people, you know you have a feeling. You know that there has to be a connection but there isn't anything necessarily that can respond to your feeling. Um, and so that brings us back to whose stories are told, who, how is space interpreted and who's included and connected to the space and who isn't. And what does that mean for individuals um, in navigating that space and how you relate to that space? It is very impactful. So I think it's, it's incumbent for all of us you know, in our different spheres, um, educators or whatnot in museum spaces and in, uh, you know, cities and town, um, you know, spaces to really think about that. What does that mean for us as part of our public history and public memory, our shared history? How can we always continue to strive to be more inclusive of that? So thank you so much for this. Well, I think we're just about through, I think we're just about through the questions. I want to make sure that I've gotten to everyone here. Um, I see that uh, we have lots of links shared. So make sure, I mean, of course, this will be recorded. So people, does, that doesn't record the chat. Never mind. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> just make sure you take those links, those links down. Um, I believe Tom from Kingston, Tom Riddles, he did uh, elaborate they're research, researching a Black history exhibit for the city of Kingston. He'd be happy to share all of his, um, his details with anyone. He's provided his email address there. Um, 
and also in response to to Michelle's comment as well, when it comes to Lake on the Mountain, I encourage everyone on this call that lives in the county to reach out to Ontario Parks because they look after the Lake on the Mountain site. And I happen to know that Carlin Thompson, who's recently taken on that role of interpretive sort of elements, she's looking after interpretive elements at the park these days and would be very receptive to all of your comments should you be able to inundate her um, with, uh, you know, with calls calls to action for that because she'd be pretty pretty excited I think to hear from all of you um I would and say and I would just add something to that um more broadly when you talk about you know the interpretation that that's something that I would want to stress is also important as well how are these stories being interpreted um and so it we have to also be mindful how these stories are positioned and represented um, are we upholding and potentially upholding and and um, not troubling the idea of human bondage and just kind of reaffirming that? Or are we representing this history as a, 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 a understanding, um, you know, the systems of oppression, the, um, the racial dynamics, looking at, you know, in a very complex way, but also, as I said throughout my talk, that we are recognizing these individuals as human beings, as mothers, as fathers, as children. And so there, we have to also be important in how these stories are being put forward and that, that this should be done collaboratively with people who have more experience. Um, and, and so I do also want to give that caution as well, that we have to ensure that these stories are handled and, and treated in a way that does not reify and reaffirm um, um, the issues, the systemic barriers, the injustice, the subjugation, the violence, the horror of enslavement, that we have to trouble that as well. And so I, I wanted to make sure that I, I put that forth because as we push for the in, the representation and the interpretation, we have to also think about how it's, it's interpreted. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Natasha. I think, you know, we've had uh, a lot of discussions about plaques around here lately, the past couple of years as our, you may or may not know, we had a statue of Johnny McDonald on our Picton Main Street there was a lot of discussion about leaving it up and putting up new plaques. And that notion that there is a neutral there way is to no present, neutral way to there present. is no neutral, right? Um, and so kind of exploding our own comfort with this narrative that is so commonly told it is critically important in what we're doing, right? That we're talking about stepping back into the truth of what happened mm -hmm. and being uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? yeah. And and also not making it entirely a past tense story. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then even in, and we're going to close, but I just want to say that in that interpretation, even um, and, you know, given my experience with Black history, there, there it can be handled in such a way that even in the goal of trying to present Black history, that it still does center white voices and white experiences. And so then the, 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 the Black narrative gets lost and again, minimized and marginalized. So we also have to right, be very cognizant of that. And so it does take a particular lens, different kinds of lenses, and again, working collaboratively with people with the, who can help to ensure that it is done in a, in a, and treated in a very respectful way. So I, I just wanted to make sure that we uh, we touched on that. But this has been um, a great evening, and I'm glad that I gave a lot of time for questions that I, and, that, and I anticipated that there would be some and I, I was right. So I wanted to thank you so much um, for everyone who attended and uh, to continue to look out for more work um, on, on my end. And again, that we always leave on a note of action that we all are have the role and the capacity to do something to make the change that we wanna see. And so I encourage you to do that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody, and uh, stay tuned for the, the YouTube link. But um, that's, that's all we can say. So have a great evening. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thank you so much, Natasha. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.